Hi, my name is Scott the Miniature Maniac, and today we are getting this crystal brush display base painted up. What up, Mini Family? By the time you're watching this video, it will be the Friday of the convention, and Crystal Brush will be in full swing. Lord willing, I've actually completed my Crystal Brush entry, and I will be in the running for Judge's Final Cut. If I make it past the first cut, you will see me post about voting on my Instagram, my Facebook, and my YouTube community. What this is, is a public vote. You, as viewers, can go and look at all of the finalists and decide what you like the most by rating it from one star to five star. And all I gotta say about that is if you don't give me five stars, we're not best friends anymore. So think about that. Also, if you happen to be watching this and you are at the convention, there is a Miniac meetup today, Friday, at the boardroom at 9 p.m. It's in the scheduled calendar if you wanna check it out. Come hang out with me and also John, but most importantly me, because I'm way cooler than John. All right, last we spoke, I left fat chunks of epoxy sculpt pretending to be hair on this miniature with the intention of shaving it down to thin strands of hair. Yeah, that didn't work out so well. It slid right off the wire armature. So I clipped off the wires and had a new plan of attack. As many of you suggested and as I realized I should just try to use the cotton again like I did for the fire. So I prepared the cotton in the same way as I did the last video and attached it to my armature. It looked okay. I decided to soldier on with the rope that is fastening this witch to the cross. I strapped her down on the arms and the feet and glued it with super glue. I did it around the feet as well because when someone's being crucified, they get nailed in their hands and feet. Otherwise, they slump down and die of suffocation. And we want to prolong this suffering as much as possible. Oh, isn't that nice? Also, the rope hides any epoxy sculpt errors I had toward the bottom of the mini. Score! I figured the dress would bunch up around where the rope was tied on her leg, so I busted out some more putty and got to sculpting that detail in. Okay, let's jump back to the base while that putty cures. If you remember last time, I kind of jumped the gun a little bit, undercoating the base. So I redid exactly what I did, except this time I also undercoated the logs and the flames. I'm slowly increasing in brightness around each individual flame with my undercoat. Then, once I had the flames undercoated, I masked off the ground and started to slap some paint on the church face. I wanted to go for a brown wood with a white trim that was chipping. I want the gradient of light to be bright bottom to top, so not only does the brown wood need to do that, but also the white trim and the exposed wood below the white trim when I do the chipping. The order of operations matters here, so pay attention. After laying down a nice chocolatey brown midtone, I started to build up my highlights toward the fire. One flame is particularly close to the building, so I hit that side of the church with more highlight than the other. Then I started to add in my shadow. Sometimes the highlight can run a little rampant, so I like to do the shadows last when I'm airbrushing to kind of pare down the brightness appropriately. Okay, pop back to the witch now that the putty has had time to cure. It's time to prime this babe black, so I attached her to a little handle and got to priming. This step is especially scary. This is when all of the problems are revealed. First, I had to clean off the Vaseline left behind, and then I could dry her off and get to undercutting it. Guess what? A lot of my epoxy sculpt work was garbage, and the hair looked like crap. At this point, I was pretty demoralized about the hair thing, so I set it down and decided I was going to work on the building until I thought of a better solution for the hair, if there even was one. With the brown gradient established, it was time to mask off the parts that would remain brown and start with the white trim. I was scared that I wouldn't be able to create a smooth enough transition over such a long piece with a paintbrush, so I resorted to using the airbrush. With the side flaps added, I couldn't help myself. Next, I applied AK's heavy chipping medium to all the exposed parts and applied my gradient of white. This is exactly like the brown, but with various shades of white and gray. After that was done, it was time for the big reveal. Removing masking tape is always so <laughs> sexual. Seeing the fruits of my masking labor was good for my morale. I was really dreading that tedious task of masking, and I was glad it was all over and that it also worked seemingly. 
Time for stripping that paint. With a damp brush, I went about reactivating that stripping layer below. And what happened was not what I expected to happen. I kind of expected the paint to lightly flake away, but instead it peeled off and left behind a texture. I was also apparently lifting some brown paint too as it was standing the white trim. This wasn't horrible, in fact, the peeling paint was kind of cool, but maybe next time I'll wait before doing this for all the layers to fully dry. Once I had the white trim sufficiently chipped, it was time to apply a gloss varnish. One, I needed to protect the paint from chipping further, and two, I wanted to apply an oil wash next, and it functions best on a glossy surface. Well, all washes function best on a glossy surface, but anyways, Mixing up oil washes isn't too hard. You take the oil paint and mineral spirits and mix them together. An important part of this process is to drop a can of aerosol from high up, knocking over your bottle of mineral spirits and your competition entry in the process and dumping it all onto the ground. But I hear you asking, how much mineral spirit should I use, both in the wash and also spilled all over the floor? Well, you want to add enough so the oil is thinned, but not so much that when you apply it to a surface, it starts to separate. It's pretty easy to experiment with and find the correct consistency. Once I got the right consistency, I applied it all over the base and wow, did that look awful. <laughs> but don't despair. I let the oil cure sufficiently overnight and then came back with more mineral spirits and a cotton swab to clean up the top surfaces of the church, leaving the crevices still dark. Oil washes are cool because you can reactivate them with mineral spirits to clean them up. I'm always concerned that doing this cotton swab step is going to sponge up wash left behind in areas where I want it to stay, and it does, but it leaves behind enough detail to make the process worth it. You could be more careful with your application of the wash, making cleanup easier, but in my case, I had texture literally all over, so it made sense to flood the surface with wash. With the surface cleaned up and the oil wash dry, I hit it up with a matte varnish to seal it all in and return it to a better finish. It's worth mentioning that whenever I apply varnish, I'm applying three to four layers of it. Like with a normal acrylic color, it takes a few coats of varnish to reach its maximum opacity. I painted the roof shingles with a bunch of different dark tones and then spritzed the top with light gray with my airbrush from too far away with paint that was too thick, intentionally to get a gravelly look. I did this twice, once with light gray and once with black. I might've been too heavy handed with the black. Next, I started to paint all the metallic bits, the hinges, door handles, and the crosses. I went for a silver for the hinges and a brass color for the cross. Instead of shading these with a wash, I just used normal acrylic paint and applied it to all of the recesses. I have a hard time saying that word, recesses. I highlighted all these parts appropriately and tried to make the handle look like it was especially beaten up. I hit it with a sponge with black paint to create these little pock marks in the handle. I then highlighted the marks with a bright silver with a tiny dot immediately below the defect and bang, nice little 3D effect. Next, I started with some rust on the hinges. I built up a desaturated orange color with a thin consistency in areas where moisture would collect, like in between the bolt and the hinge. Once that was sufficiently intense enough, I started to sparingly add more saturated and brighter orange color. Sometimes I would dot this in to create a texture as well because rust tends to break up the surface of metal a bit. Next, I added some more definition to my shingling via panel lining it with pure black paint and then followed it up with a scratchy edge highlight for further definition. Next, I painted the stone chimney thing on top with some yellow tones, making sure to add the brightest part facing toward the fire. After that was done, I worked on the stone frame of the window that many of you structural engineers cringed about after I added it. I mixed up a little gradient of colors and painted each brick a darker color as it went toward the top. I then wet blended the tones on each rock to get a more seamless transition in between them. I added some deep shadows and some edge highlights and scratches to give the stone some more texture. I added some more chipping to the white trim, but now with the sponge technique again to get smaller, finer paint chips. Now it's time to go in with whites and bright grays to do edge highlights to enunciate some of the paint chips to give them more definition. As I move toward the top of the church, I'm using darker and darker colors for my edge highlights. I also start to shade the paint chips toward the top of the chip. This gives them a strange depth, like the paint chip is a deeper hole in the side of the building. I don't know about the reality of this effect, but it does look cool. I now did the same thing for the wooden panels, adding more highlights to enunciate some of those deeper grooves. 
I know you noticed the painted window, but just hold on for a hot minute. Let's talk about painting the ground first. I used some thin paint, a crappy brush, and I wet blended the dirt color. As I got closer to the flame, I obviously increased in brightness. And the further away, I got darker. I then washed it with an acrylic wash and started to dry brush in some more of those tones to kind of amp up the OSL effect. Then I started to work on the logs. Very similar to the dirt, I had to consider how the flames would light the logs based on how close they were to each flame. The closer they were, the brighter the highlight on the log. Basically, if you understand the concepts in the how to highlight everything video, you'll understand what I'm doing here. Instead of there being a sun as my main source of light, my main source of light is three individual flames. Next, I painted all the flames white because the next step depended on it. I painted all the flames the hottest pink known to man, but the reflection in the window is orange, so what the heck is going on here? Okay, let me explain. I wanted to make the fire a weird color to imply that the witch with her evil witchiness was changing the color via some dark magic. I wanted to use a color like hot pink or electric green, but I didn't want to bathe the scene in that kind of OSL. I wanted to paint the fire a fun color, but I also wanted to pretend that the fire was giving off a natural light because I find that more interesting than tinting the whole scene one color. But at some point I had the thought, do I really want to hear all weekend long at Crystal Brush the question, why didn't you use the RSL color all over the side? And so I got cold feet and I made the fire color orange with the anticipation of it being kind of more of a natural color. But then, I overcame that thought and was like, screw it, let's make it pink, because pink's awesome, and I'm gonna use any excuse I can get to use pink. Are you following the story? With the hottest pink base coat applied, I started to add highlights and shadows. I mixed in white and applied the highlight where the flame would be strongest, nearest to the wood, and also in deep pockets of fire. I went to pure white. I then applied purple toward where it'd be the coolest, toward the end of the flame tendrils. I also added some black and gray paint around where the flame was on the wood to simulate burnt crispy wood. Now with all three flames done, it's time for static grass. I added some various tufts of dark grass and dead looking grass. I even added some to the roof. I really wanted this building to look ancient. I wanted to add vines as well, but I was afraid they were too vibrant, so I hit them up with some black acrylic paint via my airbrush and adhered them to the building with super glue. I think black vines are my coolest idea yet. I then repainted the reflection of the fire in the window with pink fire now and covered it with Vallejo still water effects to simulate glass. This wasn't the greatest idea as it dried a little wavy as opposed to being flat like normal glass. Next, I wanted to add some leaves, but since there's snow all over the ground in Minnesota, I couldn't punch any out of real leaves, so I tried a few different approaches. First, I tried soaking a coffee filter in some watered down inks. That didn't really work at all. Next, I tried to apply paint with an airbrush to baking paper. That didn't work either because the paint kind of just peeled off of it. Next, I tried to apply paint to the coffee filter instead of soaking it, and after letting it sufficiently dry, I was able to punch out some nice leaves and adhere them to the building. Bonus, the paint soaks into the filter, so when you punch out the leaves, there's no weird edge that's a different color. Dioramas are all about variety. You need a lot of something to read as realistic. This is when looking at real life images really helps to inspire. As the pièce de résistance, I added some cobwebs. The trick to doing this is to put crackle medium from an art supply store into an airbrush you don't care about and shoot it out. Make sure to mask off whatever you don't want to hit because this stuff gets everywhere. It looks so good. I was done. I posted a picture of it on Instagram and my buddy Joshua reached out to me and said, hey, do you want some feedback? Oh jeez, I don't think I can handle doing anything more to this base. Joshua's suggestion was to have a lot of blue added to my church building to represent the moonlight in the environment. And generally speaking, I was kind of opposed to doing this because when you look at those dual tone scenes in miniature painting, you have kind of two colors. You have blue and the color of the fire, which in a lot of cases is orange. And I don't really like that, but Joshua did a little bit of editing in Lightroom and sent me some examples and I was hooked. It sold the effect of the OSL so much more. Shout out to Joshua Lai. If you don't know about Joshua, check out his Instagram linked in the description below. He makes amazing works of art. 
So I broke out the Citadel Blue Glaze, masked off my glass window, and slowly applied the color until I got it where I wanted it. The Blue Glaze didn't affect the dark brown wood as much as it did the trim. So I went back in with dark blue paint and added it in to make it look like the moonlight had a similar effect on the dark brown wood. Some more edge highlighting, cleaning up the sides of the base, and we have a sick base all painted up. Painting this base was the fuel that I needed to finish the rest of my crystal brush piece. It's not terribly hard to paint terrain, and the effect is always pretty dang cool. So now I can go into painting the witch with more enthusiasm than I had previously. So the next video is gonna come out after Crystal Brush is already going to be over and it's gonna be about painting the witch. So stay tuned for that. If you guys like this video, this is part six of a ongoing series about how I am designing, converting, and painting a piece for competition. So you can check out the entire series before that. Also some more announcements. I'm still looking for a resin caster for a miniature that I'm trying to create. Preferably a company that has experience casting 75 mil miniatures. If you guys know anyone who has experience or you have experience, feel free to reach out to me. I on this email right here. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Guys, if you like this series and you want to support the channel, there are links in the description that enable you to do so, namely a Patreon campaign with a bunch of fun rewards, such as access to a Discord server where you and I can hang out any day of the week and chat about the taste of ketchup, but also your miniature painting projects. It's full of a bunch of miniature painters of all different skill levels. You can also use an Amazon shopping link, my Amazon shopping link specifically, that you can find links in the description while shopping on Amazon. Subscribe or die! And more importantly, don't forget to paint my minis!